The mystery of the empty house calls in Akita City, Japan is a strange phenomenon that has puzzled both residents and authorities. This entry involves unexplained emergency calls to the fire department's 119 number originating from landlines in vacant homes. The calls include mechanical noises such as pink noise and machine-like sounds rather than human voices. The Akita City Fire Department has recorded an unusual increase in these mysterious calls since May 2020. Prior to this, these types of events were rare, with with only one or two cases reported annually. However, in the time leading up to November 2020, nine cases were documented. These calls occur at various times, including early dawn and late at night, and often result in firefighters arriving at homes to find them empty, or the residents unaware of any emergency call being made. In some instances, residents have returned home to find their neighborhood in a state of commotion due to the unexpected arrival of emergency services. This has understandably caused frustration and bewilderment among those affected. The fire department has expressed concern that these incidents could lead to conflicts, especially when they occur during inconvenient times such as the middle of the night. The Akita Fire Department has conducted investigations into the equipment used for receiving emergency calls, but has found no abnormalities. The head of the control section noted that many of these calls seem to originate from older devices such as black rotary dial phones rather than modern push-button telephones. In response to the recurring incidents, the fire department submitted a letter to NTT East, the regional telecommunications provider seeking technological guidance. NTT East has been collaborating with the fire department to investigate whether the calls could be caused by faults in their equipment. Despite these efforts, the exact cause of the calls remains undetermined. Similar incidents have been reported in Aomori City, where emergency calls were made from uninhabited locations, such as a locked cottage at Mount Hakuda. In these cases, the phone lines were suspected to be disordered, but no definitive explanation was provided. Alexander Slowly, aka Alex, or Gog, was born on August 4th, 1991. He was raised in Islington, North London. Alex was one of four children with three sisters, Tasha, Tazra, and Latina. His parents, Nerissa and Christopher, were separated, but both played active roles in their children's lives. Alex's mother often emphasized the importance of education and hard work, which Alex embraced throughout his life. Alex attended the Islington Arts and Media School, where he was known for his intelligence and dedication to his studies. He had a keen interest in mathematics and aspired to become an accountant. He was well liked by his teachers and peers. In addition to his studies, Alex was passionate about sports, particularly football. Along with football, Alex had a fondness for music. While it seemed that life was going good for Alex from the outside, there was much turmoil back home. Growing up in a single-parent household, Alex was aware of the financial constraints his family faced. However, his mother, Nerissa, worked tirelessly to provide for her children and instilled in them the importance of perseverance and resilience. The separation of his parents was another aspect of Alex's life that shaped his experiences. Although his parents maintained a cordial relationship, the dynamics of a split household presented emotional challenges for Alex and his siblings. Alex's father, Christopher, played a significant role in his life, offering guidance and support. However, in 2014, Christopher met his untimely end. On August 2nd, 2008, Alex, then just two days shy of his 17th birthday, was staying at a friend's house in Edmonton, North London. The day was expected to be like any other, with Alex planning to return home to Islington to prepare for his upcoming birthday celebrations. He left his friend's house around noon, intending to make the journey back to his family. Alex's departure from his friend's house seemed routine. He was reportedly in good spirits and did not express any concerns or intentions to deviate from his plan to return home. However, this would be the last time anyone would see or hear from him. Alex made the journey from Edmonton to Islington many times in the past. 
Despite this familiarity, Alex never arrived home that day. His disappearance was both sudden and mysterious, with no clear indication of what might have happened to him. At the time of his disappearance, Alex had limited resources. He left with little money, no change of clothes, and did not carry his passport, suggesting that he had no plans to travel far or be away for an extended period. Additionally, his phone stopped connecting shortly after he left his friend's house, cutting off any potential means of contact. When Alex failed to return home, his family quickly became concerned. It was uncharacteristic of him to disappear without notifying anyone, and the lack of communication was alarming. His mother and other family members began reaching out to friends and acquaintances, hoping to find any information about his whereabouts. His family reported him missing to the police, hoping for a swift response and resolution. However, as time passed without any sign of Alex, their concerns deepened. The police launched an investigation into Alex's disappearance, but the case quickly proved challenging. Despite extensive efforts, including searches and public appeals, there were no significant leads or breakthroughs. One of the major obstacles was the lack of any evidence, which left investigators with little information to work with. The investigation faced criticism from Alex's family, particularly regarding the perceived lack of urgency and transparency. His mother expressed frustration over the police's handling of the case, believing that socioeconomic factors may have influenced the level of attention it received. She felt that the police did not take the disappearance seriously enough in the critical early stages, which may have hindered the investigation. In 2015, it was revealed that police had received multiple reports of sightings of Alex in 2009, information that had not been shared with his family at the time. This revelation raised questions about communication and coordination within the investigation, further fueling concerns about the officials involved. One of the initial theories considered by the investigators was that Alex may have run away voluntarily voluntarily. However, this theory was largely dismissed by his family, who insisted that Alex had no reason to leave without explanation. He was described as a responsible and family-oriented individual, with plans to celebrate his birthday and aspirations for the future. The lack of preparation for an extended absence, such as not taking clothes or a passport, also contradicted the idea of a planned departure. Another theory posits that Alex may have fallen victim to foul play. The suddenness of his disappearance and the absence of any communication raised concerns about his safety. Some speculated that Alex could have encountered someone with malicious intent leading to his disappearance. However, without any evidence of harm or a crime scene, this theory remains speculative. In 2017, retired police officer Mick Neville suggested a potential link between Alex's disappearance and that of another missing teenager, Andrew Gosden. Gostin disappeared in 2007, less than a year before Alex, and was last seen at King's Cross, close to Islington. Neville speculated about the possibility of a serial killer targeting young males in the area, suggesting that the cases might be connected. Despite this theory gaining some media attention, no concrete evidence has emerged to support it. The mystery of antimatter comets is a topic in astrophysics that mixes scientific inquiry with speculative hypotheses. The idea that comets and meteoroids could be composed of antimatter dates back to the 1940s when physicist Vladimir Rojansky proposed the existence of contraterrene matter. Despite the intrigue, there is no empirical evidence supporting the existence of antimatter comets and several scientific arguments suggest their non-existence. The hypothesis of antimatter comets emerged as a potential explanation explanation for certain unexplained phenomena, such as explosive meteor strikes and gamma ray bursts. The idea was that these bodies, if made of antimatter, would annihilate upon contact with regular matter, producing significant energy releases observable as such phenomena. According to the nebular hypothesis, the solar system formed from a pre-solar nebula. If antimatter had been present in significant amounts, it would have annihilated with matter long before the formation of solid bodies like comets. The annihilation time is much shorter than the collapse time of the nebula, making the presence of antimatter in the solar system highly unlikely. Likely. Martin Beach argued that any antimatter comets must be extrasolar in origin as the formation processes within the solar system would have annihilated any antimatter present. Several lines of observational evidence argue against the existence of antimatter comets. Space probes have shown that bodies like Mars, Venus, and the Moon are not composed of antimatter, as they would have been annihilated upon contact. Additionally, the lack of gamma ray emissions from interactions between antimatter and the solar wind further supports the absence of large antimatter bodies in the Milky Way.
The Caldwell Fields murders involved two individuals named Heidi Childs and David Metzler. This tragic event occurred on August 26, 2009, when the two Virginia Tech students were found shot dead at Caldwell Fields in the Jefferson National Forest, Virginia. Heidi Childs was born in Lynchburg, Virginia, and grew up in a close-knit family as the fourth of eight children. Her upbringing was deeply rooted in faith and community, which played a significant role in shaping her character. Heidi was known for her vibrant personality, intelligence, and strong sense of independence. She was a bright student with a promising future ahead of her. During her high school years, Heidi was actively involved in various extracurricular activities including church youth groups and community service projects. At Virginia Tech, she initially enrolled in the biochemistry program but was considering a switch to pre-med. David Metzler was also born and raised in Lynchburg, Virginia and shared a similar upbringing to Heidi with a strong emphasis on faith and family values. David was the eldest child in his family and his father described him as his best friend, highlighting the close bond they shared. David was known for his gentle demeanor, kindness, and strong sense of responsibility. He was an active member of his church and participated in various community activities. David's interests extended beyond academics as he enjoyed outdoor activities such as hiking and camping. At Virginia Tech, David was pursuing a degree in engineering. He was well liked by his peers and professors, who recognized his dedication and potential for success in his chosen career path. Heidi and David's paths crossed during their time in high school where they met through a church youth group. Their shared values and interests laid the foundation for a strong friendship that eventually blossomed into a romantic relationship. Their relationship continued to flourish as they both enrolled at Virginia Tech, where they balanced their academic pursuits with spending time together. Friends and family members often remarked on the couple's compatibility and the joy they brought to each other's lives. They were seen as a perfect match for each other. Caldwell Fields is a secluded area within the Jefferson National Forest in Montgomery County, Virginia. The area is accessible by a gravel road and is surrounded by dense woods. On the evening of August 26, 2009, Heidi and David decided to visit the area. They drove David's 1992 Toyota Camry to the site, planning to relax and enjoy each other's company. The following morning, on August 27th, a passerby walking his dogs made a grim discovery. He stumbled upon David's car parked at Caldwell Fields and noticed something unusual. Upon closer inspection, he found David inside the vehicle, slumped over the steering wheel, and Heidi's body outside the car. Both had been fatally shot. The passerby immediately contacted law enforcement and the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office, along with the Virginia State Police, responded to the scene. The area was cordoned off as a crime scene, and investigators began the meticulous process of collecting evidence and piecing together the events that had transpired. Both Heidi and David had been shot with a 30 caliber hunting rifle. The investigation revealed that David had been shot while seated in the driver's seat of his car, while Heidi was found outside the vehicle, suggesting she may have attempted to flee or was outside when the attack occurred. The crime scene provided limited physical evidence. No casings were found, leading investigators to believe that the shooter may have used a lever-action rifle, which apparently does not automatically eject casings. Additionally, Heidi's purse, which contained her credit cards, phone, and college ID, was missing and has never been recovered. This detail led to speculation about robbery as a potential motive, although it remains unclear. The investigation involved multiple law enforcement agencies, including the Virginia State Police, FBI, and local police departments. A collection of DNA evidence was recovered from the scene, but it has not been matched to any known suspects. One of the significant challenges faced by investigators was the lack of witnesses. Caldwell Fields is a remote area and the crime occurred at night, reducing the likelihood of anyone having seen or heard anything suspicious. Additionally, the isolated nature of the location made it difficult to gather information from nearby residents or passers-by. Over the years, investigators have pursued numerous leads and tips from the public, but none have resulted in a breakthrough. The case has remained open, with law enforcement agencies continuing to appeal to the public for any information that might help solve the mystery. This next entry is a peculiar case that captured public attention due to its bizarre nature and the lack of clear answers. The Skegness bus woman incident takes us to August 6, 2019, on a bus traveling from Lincoln to Skegness, involving an elderly woman and two male passengers who sustained unexplained injuries. As the bus traveled along its route, the two young men engaged in casual conversation with an elderly woman seated nearby. 
Descriptions of the woman were vague, but she was noted to be elderly, with no particularly distinguishing features that stood out to other passengers. The conversation appeared to be friendly and unremarkable. At some point during the journey, the elderly woman extended her hand to the two men to exchange a handshake. The men accepted. However, what seemed like a benign interaction soon took a strange turn. After the handshake, the woman left the bus in the town of Horncastle, leaving the two men to continue their journey to Skegness. Shortly after the woman left the bus, the two men noticed something unusual. Both had developed small puncture wounds on their hands, precisely where they had shaken hands with the elderly woman. The injuries were peculiar. They were not deep or bleeding profusely, but they were noticeable enough to cause concern. The men reported feeling a slight stinging sensation, which prompted them to examine their hands more closely. Upon arrival in Skegness, the two men went to a local hospital to have their injuries assessed. Medical staff examined the puncture wounds and, after a thorough evaluation, determined that the injuries were not serious. The men were given the all clear with no signs of infection or immediate health concerns. However, the cause of the injuries remained unexplained, leaving both the victims and medical professionals baffled. Upon receiving the report from the two men, Lincolnshire police took immediate action to investigate the incident. The police treated the case as a potential assault, given the unexplained puncture wounds on the men's hands. The investigation aimed to determine how the injuries occurred and whether any criminal intent was involved. One of the first steps in the investigation was to gather evidence from the scene. However, the transient nature of the incident occurring on a moving bus presented significant challenges. There were no CCTV cameras on the bus, which limited the ability to review footage that might have captured the interaction between the elderly woman and the two men. Now, officials did release images of people of interest, including the men, but it was never explicitly stated where these images were captured. I just wanted to say that in case someone questioned where the pictures came from if there were no cameras, the police interviewed the bus driver and other passengers to gather witness statements. However, the accounts were inconclusive, with no one able to provide definitive details about the handshake or the elderly woman's actions. The lack of concrete evidence made it difficult for investigators to establish a clear timeline or identify any suspicious behavior. One of the most prevalent theories was that the elderly woman had used a concealed needle or sharp object during the handshake. This theory suggested that the woman might have intentionally or unintentionally pricked the men's hands, causing the puncture wounds. The idea of a hidden needle was supported by the nature of the injuries, which resembled needle pricks. However, this theory raised several questions. If the woman had used a needle, what was her motive? Was it a deliberate act of malice, or could it have been an accidental occurrence? Additionally, the men did not report feeling any immediate pain during the handshake, which would be unusual if a needle had been involved. Another theory considered the possibility of an allergic reaction or a rare skin condition that could have caused the puncture wounds to appear spontaneously. This theory suggested that the handshake might have triggered an unusual skin reaction, resulting in the injuries. While this explanation accounted for the simultaneous occurrence of the wounds on both men, it did not fully align with the nature of the injuries. Puncture wounds typically require a physical cause, and the theory of an allergic reaction did not provide a clear mechanism for how the injuries were inflicted. Some speculated that the incident might have a psychological explanation. The handshake with the elderly woman could have triggered a psychosomatic response, where the men perceived injuries that were not physically present. This theory suggested that the power of suggestion or stress could have led to the manifestation of the wounds. Although intriguing, this theory was difficult to substantiate. The men had visible puncture wounds which were confirmed by medical professionals, making it unlikely that the injuries were purely psychological in nature. Another possibility considered was that the injuries were the result of an accidental cause unrelated to the handshake. The men might have come into contact with a sharp object elsewhere on the bus, and the handshake with the elderly woman was coincidental. However, this theory did not account for the timing of the injuries, which appeared immediately after the handshake. The mystery of Cyber Anakin involves a complex array of hacktivism activities carried out by an individual or group using the pseudonym inspired by Anakin Skywalker from Star Wars. Cyber Anakin is known for its involvement in various political and social causes, employing hacking techniques to make political statements and influence public perception. In Star Wars, the character of Anakin goes through a complex transformation from a promising hero to the infamous Darth Vader. 
Some have speculated that by adopting this name, the hacktivist behind Cyber Anakin may be signaling a similar journey or transformation, positioning themselves as a figure operating on the fringes of accepted norms, challenging authority, and navigating the moral ambiguities of hacktivism. Like many hacktivists, they operate behind layers of digital obfuscation, using tools and techniques to conceal their real-world identity. This anonymity serves multiple purposes. It protects the individual from legal repercussions, allows for greater freedom of expression, and creates an enigmatic persona that can captivate public interest. By selectively revealing information and crafting messages, Cyber Anakin shapes how they are perceived by the public, media, and authorities. This persona is not static. It evolves with each new operation and public statement, adapting to the changing landscape of global politics and hacktivism. Amongst Cyber Anakin's key activities, there is the opposition to North Korea, where the figure took a strong stance against the regime's policies and propaganda. In 2018, Cyber Anakin exploited a vulnerability in a North Korean propaganda website, which allowed them to register a spoof Twitter account. This account was used to disseminate anti-DPRK messages, including derogatory content aimed at Kim Jong-un. This act served as both a digital protest and a form of satire, undermining the regime's attempts to control its narrative and showcasing the power of hacktivism in challenging authoritarian propaganda. The hacktivist also claimed responsibility for breaching the US branch of the Korean Friendship Association, a pro-North Korean group. By targeting this organization, Cyber Anakin aimed to disrupt its operations operations and highlight the discrepancies between its messaging and the realities of the North Korean regime. These actions highlight Cyber Anakin's commitment to opposing what they perceive as oppressive and misleading narratives. Cyber Anakin also played central roles in the opposition to the European Union's directive on copyright in the digital single market, as well targeting Iranian government websites after the downing of Ukraine International Airlines Flight 752. In 2022, Cyber Anakin launched Operation Wrath of Anakin No Time to Die, a campaign targeting Chinese computer systems, including government websites and infrastructure interfaces. This operation was reportedly motivated by personal grievances and broader political motivations, reflecting Anakin's continued engagement with global issues. During this operation, Anakin defaced targeted systems with symbols of separatist movements and memorials for COVID victims. The operation highlighted Anakin's willingness to engage with complex and sensitive geopolitical issues using their skills to challenge state actors and advocate for change. By targeting Chinese systems, Cyber Anakin positioned themselves as a global actor, capable of influencing international discourse through digital means. To this day, no one is certain as to who Cyber Anakin really is. The Myojo 56 building was located in the Kabukicho section of Shinjuku, Tokyo, Japan. This area is known for its nightlife, hosting numerous entertainment venues, bars, and clubs. The building itself housed a video mahjong parlor and a hostess bar, among other establishments. The Myojo 56 building fire was a catastrophic event that unfolded in the early hours of September 1st, 2001. The fire began around 1am local time and quickly became one of the deadliest in Japan's post-war history, claiming 44 lives and injuring three others. The building was engulfed in flames that burned for five hours before firefighters could extinguish them. The fire originated on the third floor of the building, where 19 people were present at the time. Another 28 individuals were on the fourth floor. The rapid spread of the fire was facilitated by several fire code violations, including blocked fire doors and stairwells, which significantly hindered evacuation efforts. The building's automated fire doors were reportedly obstructed, allowing smoke and deadly gases to permeate the occupied floors almost immediately. As the fire broke out, three employees on the third floor attempted to escape by jumping from the building. They survived but sustained injuries, prompting witnesses to call for emergency services. Upon arrival, emergency responders were informed of the fire and commenced evacuation efforts. Firefighters faced significant challenges due to the building's layout and the intensity of the blaze. Despite their efforts, they were only able to rescue those who managed to flee to the roof. 
The bodies of 44 victims, comprising 32 men and 12 women, were later recovered from inside the building. The firefighting efforts were complicated by the building's structural issues and the rapid spread of carbon monoxide, which was the primary cause of death for the victims. Investigations later revealed that if the building's fire doors had functioned properly, the spread of toxic gases could have been delayed by at least 20 minutes, potentially saving lives. The blocked exits and stairwells not only trapped victims, but also made it difficult for firefighters to access certain areas of the building efficiently. The investigation was marked by suspicions of arson, allegations of negligence, and speculations about organized crime involvement. The primary focus was to determine whether the fire was accidental or intentional. Early on, suspicions of arson emerged due to the rapid spread of the fire and the presence of numerous fire code violations. By July 3rd, 2008, the Tokyo police concluded that the fire resulted from arson. However, no arrests were made in connection with this charge. The investigation struggled with a lack of material evidence and eyewitness accounts that could definitively link any individual or group to the act of arson. Despite the conclusion, the absence of concrete evidence meant that the case remained unresolved in terms of identifying a perpetrator. In the wake of the fire, six individuals were arrested on charges of professional negligence, resulting in death. These individuals included two executives from the Miyojo Kosen Group, the company that owned the building, as well as commercial tenants operating within the structure. The investigation also explored potential links to organized crime, given the illegal gambling operations within the building. The Mahjong Parlor was was identified as an illegal gambling den reportedly generating daily revenues of about 8 million yen. Speculations arose that the Chinese mafia and Yakuza could have been involved, possibly due to disputes over protection money commonly demanded by organized crime syndicates from such establishments. Despite these suspicions, there was no material or eyewitness evidence to substantiate claims of organized crime involvement in the fire. The lack of evidence meant that this angle of the investigation could not be pursued further, leaving questions about potential criminal connections unanswered. This entry takes us to Resolven, Neath, South Wales in March 2002. Robert Williams was born in 1986 and grew up in the small village of Resolven. Robert was raised by his mother, Cheryl Davies, who described him as a lively and mischievous child. He had a younger brother and the family lived in a modest home in a cul-de-sac. Robert's father passed away when he was young, which had a significant impact on him. Despite the loss, he was known for his infectious smile and energetic personality. His mother fondly recalled his playful nature and the joy he brought to those around him. As Robert entered his teenage years, he began to experience some difficulties. Like many adolescents, he faced challenges in navigating the confusing process of growing up. Cheryl noted that Robert became more troubled during this period, and their relationship became strained at times. Despite these challenges, he was still regarded as a loving son and brother. At school, he was known to be a bright student with a good sense of humor. However, like many teenagers, Robert sometimes struggled with authority and the expectations placed upon him by adults. Socially, Robert had a circle of friends with whom he spent much of his time. His friends described him as someone who was always up for an adventure and who could easily lift the spirits of those around him. Fast forward to March 22nd, 2002, our mystery begins. On that day, Robert, then 15 years old, left his home following a disagreement with his mother. This argument, though not uncommon between teenagers and their parents, marked the last time Cheryl saw her son. She watched him walk away, expecting him to return home later, as he had done after previous disagreements. After leaving his home, Robert was last seen by a school friend over the weekend in Skewen, a village approximately 8 miles from Resolven. During this encounter, Robert reportedly mentioned his intention to return home soon, but he never did. This sighting was the last confirmed instance of Robert being seen, though several unconfirmed sightings were reported in South Wales over the following months. Despite these reports, none provided concrete leads that could help locate him. The initial response to Robert's disappearance involved both the local community and law enforcement. Friends, family, and neighbors quickly mobilized to search for him, driven by the hope of finding him safe. South Wales Police launched an official investigation, conducting door-to-door -door inquiries and searching the local area. They also made public appeals for information, urging anyone who might have seen Robert or knew of his whereabouts to come forward. 
Over the years, the investigation into Robert's disappearance has remained active. South Wales police have periodically revisited the case, conducting reviews and exploring new lines of inquiry as they arise. In 2010, they released an age progression photograph to depict what Robert might look like as an adult, hoping it would lead to new information. Detective Inspector Mark Lewis, part of the South Wales Police Major Crime Investigation Team, has emphasized the importance of keeping Robert's case open and active. The team has carried out extensive proof of life inquiries across the UK, checking national fingerprint and DNA databases, medical records, and contacting various organizations in hopes of finding any trace of Robert. Unfortunately, these efforts have not yielded any positive results. Cheryl Davies, Robert's mother, has been vocal about her ongoing distress and hope for closure. She has expressed her constant expectation that Robert might walk through the door at any moment. One of the initial theories was that Robert ran away from home. Given that he left following an argument with his mother, some speculated that he might have decided that this was the final straw and went off to start a new life. This is considered less likely due to his young age at the time and the challenges involved in creating a new identity without resources or support. Another theory is that Robert may have encountered foul play after leaving home. This theory gained traction due to the complete lack of evidence or sightings after his disappearance, suggesting that something untoward might have happened to him. Some have speculated that Robert might have met with an accident, possibly in a remote area, leading to his death. This could explain why no trace of him has been found despite extensive searches. The rugged terrain and natural features of the Welsh Valleys could potentially conceal evidence of such an accident. Buridan's Ass is a philosophical paradox that explores the challenges of decision making in situations where choices are equally appealing. Named after the 14th century French philosopher Jean Buridan, the paradox is often used to illustrate the concept of free will and determinism. Although the paradox is attributed to Buridan, similar ideas were discussed by earlier philosophers like Aristotle and Al-Ghazali. The classic scenario involves a donkey placed exactly midway between two identical piles of hay. The donkey, unable to choose one pile over the other due to their equal appeal and distance, ultimately starves to death because it cannot make a decision. This thought experiment is a critique of the idea that rational beings will always make decisions based on the most compelling reasons. In this case, the absence of a distinguishing factor between the options leads to paralysis and inaction. While the original scenario involves a donkey and hay, the paradox has been adapted to various contexts. For instance, it can involve a person choosing between two equally attractive options, such as two doors or two moral actions. The paradox is sometimes used to discuss the implications of hard determinism, which suggests that all actions are predetermined by prior causes, leaving no room for free will. Critics of the paradox argue that it presents an unrealistic view of decision making. In reality, even when options appear identical, individuals often make arbitrary or random choices to break the tie, thus avoiding paralysis. This ability to make arbitrary decisions is sometimes seen as a justification for faith or intuition. Moreover, the paradox has been analyzed in terms of logical and linguistic precision. The term identical can be misleading, as no two options are truly identical in all respects, especially when considering spatial location or other subtle differences. This critique suggests that the paradox is based on a flawed premise, as real-world decisions always involve some form of differentiation. Beyond philosophy, Buridan's ass has implications in fields such as digital electronics, where it is analogous to the problem of metastability. In this context, a system must decide between two states based on an undefined input, potentially leading to prolonged indecision. Cryptos is a cryptographic sculpture created by American artist Jim Sanborn, located at the CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. Installed in 1990, the sculpture features four encrypted messages, three of which have been decoded while the fourth remains unsolved. The sculpture's name, derived from the Greek word for hidden, reflects its enigmatic nature. Cryptos consists of a large S-shaped copper screen with nearly 2,000 characters cut into it. The sculpture incorporates materials such as petrified wood, granite, and quartz symbolizing the historical accumulation of information. The copper screen is designed to resemble a piece of paper emerging from a computer printer, emphasizing the theme of intelligence gathering. 
The first message, deciphered using a visionary cipher, reads, Between subtle shading and the absence of light lies the nuance of occlusion. The misspelling of illusion as occlusion is intentional, adding to the puzzle's complexity. The second passage provides geographic coordinates for the CIA headquarters and includes a reference to WW, which stands for William Webster, the CIA director at the time. This message hints at something buried on the premises. The third section is a paraphrase of Howard Carter's account of discovering King Tutankhamun's tomb, adding a historical layer to the sculpture's narrative. The fourth message of the crypto sculpture, known as K4, Four remains one of the most famous unsolved cryptographic puzzles. Over the years, Jim Sanborn, the creator of Cryptos, has provided several clues to aid in deciphering this message, while cryptanalysts and enthusiasts have proposed various theories and methods to crack it. Sanborn has revealed three keywords related to K4, clock, Berlin, and northeast. These words are believed to be integral to understanding the context or method needed to solve the cipher. Additionally, he has confirmed that a visionaire tableau, a method used in classical cryptography, is involved in the encryption of K4. This method was also used in the previous sections of Cryptos, suggesting that K4 might follow a similar pattern but with additional complexity. Sanborn has also hinted that the solution to K4 might involve more visual or artistic elements, reflecting his background as an artist. This suggests that the solution might not be purely textual but could involve interpreting the sculpture's physical or symbolic features. Some experts, like Dr. Craig Bauer, suggest that the four passages of Cryptos might collectively form a larger riddle, or meta-solution. This means that even if K4 is solved, there might be an overarching mystery that ties all the passages together. Another theory suggests viewing the sculpture as a Cartesian coordinate system, with the terms abscissa and ordinate representing the axes. This could imply that solving K4 requires some form of mirroring, rotation, or transformation of the characters based on these axes. Robert Hornbeck was born in Michigan, where he spent much of his early life. Growing up, Hornbeck was known for being a bright and ambitious young man with a strong sense of duty and a desire to serve his country. He excelled in academics and was actively involved in various extracurricular activities during his school years. His family and friends described him as personable, responsible, and determined, with a clear vision for his future. After high school, he attended the University of Michigan. It was during his college years that he met his future fiance, with whom he planned to build a life after his military service. Driven by a sense of patriotism and a desire to contribute to something larger than himself, Hornbeck enlisted in the United States Army. He was stationed at Fort Benning, Georgia, where he served as a specialist. His role involved various responsibilities, and he was known among his peers and superiors for his discipline, reliability, and leadership qualities. Hornbeck's military career included a year-long deployment in Iraq. His experiences in Iraq were challenging, as he faced the realities of military life in a conflict zone. Upon returning from Iraq, Hornbeck was in the process of transitioning out of the army. He had plans to resume his studies at the University of Michigan, where he intended to complete his degree. In addition to his educational goals, Hornbeck was preparing for a significant personal milestone, his marriage to his college sweetheart. The couple had been planning their wedding, which was scheduled to take place in July 2006. In April 2006, Hornbeck traveled to Savannah, Georgia to spend Easter weekend with his father and stepmother. The trip was intended as a brief retreat from his military duties and a chance to reconnect with family. During his visit, Hornbeck planned to enjoy the local sights and spend quality time with his loved ones. On the evening of April 15, 2006, Robert Hornbeck decided to spend a night out in downtown Savannah with a fellow soldier and friend. Hornbeck and his friend visited several bars throughout the evening, catching up and having a good time. As the night progressed, they consumed a significant amount of alcohol. This level of intoxication would later become a critical factor in understanding the events that unfolded. As the night wore on, the two friends decided it was time to head back. At approximately 3 a.m. on April 16th, Hornbeck's friend contacted Hornbeck's father to request a ride home. This call indicated that Hornbeck was ready to leave and was expecting to be picked up. However, when his father arrived at the designated location, Hornbeck was not there. The last known communication from Hornbeck was a brief phone call to his father. 
During this call, Hornbeck said, Dad, I'm on the stairs, before the call abruptly ended. This cryptic message left his father puzzled and concerned as it provided no clear indication of Hornbeck's whereabouts or condition. After the phone call, Hornbeck's father and stepmother searched the area where they expected to find him, but there was no sign of him. They checked nearby streets, alleys, and establishments, hoping to locate him or gather information from anyone who might have seen him. Despite their efforts, they were unable to find any trace of him. As the hours passed with no word from Hornbeck, his family became increasingly worried. His disappearance was out of character, as he was known to be responsible and reliable. The lack of communication and the circumstances of his last known movements raised alarm bells for his loved ones. Realizing the seriousness of the situation, Hornbeck's family, friends, and fellow soldiers quickly mobilized to search for him. Flyers with Hornbeck's photo and description were distributed throughout Savannah, and information about his disappearance was shared with local media outlets to raise public awareness. The search efforts were extensive and involved canvassing the areas where Hornbeck was last seen, as well as checking hospitals, shelters, and other locations where he might have sought refuge. The family also set up a hotline for tips and offered a $10,000 reward for information leading to his recovery. Despite these efforts, no substantial leads emerged, and Hornbeck's whereabouts remained a mystery. On April 28, 2006, nearly two weeks after Robert Hornbeck went missing, his body was discovered in a most unexpected and tragic location. A maintenance worker at the DeSoto Hilton Hotel in Savannah, Georgia, made the grim discovery while investigating complaints from hotel guests about a foul odor emanating from the air conditioning system. Upon inspection, the worker found Hornbeck's body inside the ductwork of the hotel's air conditioning unit. The discovery was both shocking and perplexing, as it was unclear how Hornbeck had ended up in such a location. His body was found in a state of decomposition, indicating that he had been there for several days. This revelation brought a heartbreaking end to the search efforts and left his family and friends devastated. Following the discovery of the body, an investigation was launched to determine the circumstances surrounding his death. The Savannah Police Department, along with other authorities, began examining the scene and gathering evidence to piece together what had happened. An autopsy was conducted to determine the cause of death. The results revealed that Hornbeck died from injuries sustained after being struck by a spinning blower wheel inside the air conditioning unit. The autopsy report listed blunt sharp force chop injury and acute ethanolism as the cause of death. His blood alcohol level was found to be twice the legal limit for driving, indicating that he was highly intoxicated at the time of his death. There was no evidence of substance use. The circumstances of Hornbeck's death led to various theories and speculations. Investigators concluded that his death was accidental, with no signs of foul play. It was believed that Hornbeck, in his intoxicated state, had somehow gained access to the hotel's maintenance area and entered the air conditioning system. One theory suggested that Hornbeck may have been disoriented and confused due to his level of intoxication, leading him to inadvertently enter the restricted area. Once inside, he could have climbed into the ductwork, perhaps perhaps in an attempt to find a way out or seek refuge. Unfortunately, this decision proved fatal when he encountered the spinning blower wheel. The investigation also considered the possibility that Hornbeck may have been trying to navigate through the building and accidentally ended up in the maintenance area. However, the exact sequence of events remains unclear, as there were no eyewitnesses or surveillance footage to provide additional context. The discovery of Hornbeck's body raised questions about the security and access protocols at the DeSoto Hilton Hotel. Investigators examined how Hornbeck, who was not a registered guest at the hotel, managed to enter the maintenance area and access the air conditioning system. It was determined that the area where Hornbeck was found was not easily accessible to the public, leading to questions about whether security measures were adequate. The hotel management cooperated with the investigation and reviewed their security protocols to prevent similar incidents from occurring in the future. While Robert's death was officially determined to be an accident, there seems to be a lot of speculation that there is much more to this case than what was revealed or discovered. For this next entry, we will be going back to January 7th, 1948. The Mantell UFO incident is rooted in a period of heightened interest in unidentified flying objects occurring shortly after World War II when numerous UFO sightings were reported across the United States. 
The post-war era was marked by rapid advancements in aviation technology and an increased public fascination with the possibility of extraterrestrial life. The incident took place on January 7, 1948, primarily over the skies of Kentucky. The location was Godman Army Airfield at Fort Knox, a military installation responsible for air defense and training missions. The airfield personnel were among the first to report the sighting of the mysterious object, which was described as a large metallic disc hovering in the sky. Guy. The first reports of the unidentified object came in around 1 p.m. local time. Captain Thomas F. Mantell was a highly experienced pilot with a distinguished military career. Born in Franklin, Kentucky in 1922, Mantell served as a pilot during World War II, flying missions over Europe. On the day of the incident, Mantell was part of a squadron conducting a routine training mission in P-51 Mustangs. Upon receiving orders from Godman Army Airfield, Mantell and three other pilots diverted from their training mission to intercept the unidentified object. The pilots were instructed to climb to a higher altitude to get a better view and possibly identify the object. As they approached, Mantell reported seeing the object, describing it as metallic and of tremendous size. His radio transmissions indicated a sense of urgency as he got closer for a better look at the object. The other pilots eventually broke off the pursuit due to a lack of oxygen equipment, which was necessary for high altitude flight. Mantell, however, continued to climb alone, driven by a strong desire to identify the mysterious object. His last radio transmission indicated that he was climbing to 20,000 feet despite the risks associated with flying at such altitudes without supplemental oxygen. Eventually, Mantell lost consciousness as he continued to ascend higher. Mantell's aircraft then began a downward spiral. Witnesses on the ground reported seeing the plane in a circling descent before it crashed on a farm near Franklin, Kentucky, close to the Tennessee border. The crash site was quickly reached by emergency responders who found the aircraft severely damaged and Mantell deceased. Investigators noted that Mantell's seatbelt was shredded and his wristwatch had stopped at 3.18 p.m., indicating the time of the crash. The condition of the wreckage suggested that the aircraft had disintegrated upon impact. Almost immediately, officials and enthusiasts began forming theories as to what Mantell was chasing. One of the first explanations offered by the Air Force was that Mantell had been chasing the planet Venus. This theory was based on the idea that Venus was visible in the sky at the time and could have been mistaken for a UFO. However, this explanation was met with skepticism. Experts pointed out that Venus would have appeared as a small pinpoint of light, not a large metallic object as described by Mantell and other witnesses. Additionally, the weather conditions on January 7th, 1948 were hazy, making it unlikely that Venus could be seen clearly. Another theory that gained traction was that Mantell had been pursuing a skyhook balloon. These high-altitude balloons were part of a secret Navy project used for atmospheric research. The balloons were large, reflective, and capable of reaching altitudes that could have appeared unusual to observers on the ground. This theory is supported by the fact that skyhook balloons were being launched around the same time and could have been mistaken for a UFO by Mantell, who was unaware of their existence. Given the era's fascination with flying saucers and extraterrestrial life, some speculated that Mantell had encountered an alien spacecraft. This theory was fueled by sensational media reports and the public's imagination. Some believed that Mantell's plane had been shot down by aliens, possibly using advanced technology. While there is no concrete evidence to support this theory, it remains a popular topic among UFO enthusiasts. Another speculative theory is that the military engaged in a cover-up to hide the true nature of what Mantell encountered. Proponents of this theory suggest that the Air Force's shifting explanations from Venus to skyhook balloons indicate an attempt to obscure the truth. Some believe that the object was an experimental military craft or an extraterrestrial vehicle, and the military sought to prevent public panic by providing more mundane explanations. In February 2022, a peculiar incident occurred in Frauenfeld, Switzerland, when a 38-year-old man was struck by a bullet seemingly out of nowhere. This incident, now referred to as the ghost gunshot, has baffled authorities and intrigued mystery enthusiasts alike. The incident occurred on a seemingly ordinary day as the man was taking a walk with his two children and an acquaintance. Suddenly, he experienced a sharp pain in his lower body. Initially unable to identify the source of the pain, he sought medical attention at a local hospital. It was there that doctors discovered he had been shot. The bullet was successfully removed and the man was treated for his injuries, but the mystery of how the bullet entered his body was unclear. 
The Thurgau Canton police launched an investigation into the case. However, they faced significant challenges as there were no witnesses who heard a gunshot or saw a gunman. The absence of any auditory or visual evidence of a shooting led to the case being dubbed a ghost gunshot incident. Authorities considered several possibilities, including the chance that the man was accidentally hit by a stray bullet fired from a long distance. This theory is supported by the notion that a small caliber weapon or an air gun might have been used, as these can be quieter and less noticeable than larger firearms. Martin Earhard, a weapons expert, suggested that if a large caliber weapon had been used, the effects would have been more severe and the gunshot would likely have been heard. Unfortunately, without the firearm to match the bullet, forensic experts were limited in their ability to provide further insights. The police thus relied heavily on public leads and witness accounts, though none have led to a breakthrough in the case. There are also people who suggest the possibility that the unnamed man may have inflicted the wound upon himself, but then again, many don't see a reason why he would do that. The mystery of the Harappan language associated with the Indus Valley civilization remains one of the most intriguing mysteries in archaeology and linguistics. Despite being one of the world's earliest urban cultures, the Harappan script has yet to be deciphered, leaving a significant gap in our understanding of this ancient civilization. The Harappan script, also known as the Indus script, is a collection of symbols found on numerous artifacts such as seals, tablets, and pottery. These symbols, which number over 600 distinct characters, are largely pictorial, but also include many abstract signs. The script is typically composed of short inscriptions, with most texts being no more than 4 or 5 characters long, and the longest known inscription containing 17 signs. Unlike other ancient writing systems, the Harappan script does not have long texts, which makes it difficult to identify grammatical structures or linguistic patterns. Additionally, the inscriptions are thought to have been primarily written from right to left, although this is not definitively established. One of the main challenges is the lack of bilingual inscriptions, such as the Rosetta Stone, which helped decipher Egyptian hieroglyphs. Without such comparative tools, linguists struggle to find parallels with known languages. Also, the Harappan language does not appear to have a direct descendant or a closely related language that is still in use, unlike Egyptian hieroglyphs, which were related to the Coptic language. One of the most significant discoveries related to the Harappan script is the Dolavira signboard. Found in the 1990s at the Dolavira site, this artifact features 10 large characters and is considered a crucial piece in understanding the Harappan script. The signboard's size and prominence suggest it may have served an important public or ceremonial purpose, offering potential insights into the Harappan society's beliefs and social structures. A popular theory posits that the Harappan language may be related to the Dravidian languages, particularly given given the geographical proximity of the Indus Valley to regions where Dravidian languages are spoken today. Another hypothesis suggests a connection between the Harappan language and the Elamite language of ancient Persia, proposing a proto elamo dravidian linguistic family. Dwayne Allen McCorkendale was born on June 15, 1961, in Oklahoma. He grew up in a close-knit community where he was known for his friendly demeanor and strong work ethic. Dwayne was a dedicated family man married to his wife, and together they had twin daughters. Besides committing himself to his wife and kids, Dwayne dedicated his time to his work as a truck driver. Dwayne's career in trucking wasn't just a job, but a passion. He enjoyed the freedom of the open road and took pride in his ability to transport goods safely and efficiently across long distances. He was known among his peers as a reliable and skilled driver, respected for his professionalism and dedication. His route from Detroit, Michigan to Oklahoma City was a familiar one and he had made the journey numerous times. The route was part of his regular schedule, allowing him to balance his work with time spent at home with his family. On November 12, 1988, Duane was on this routine route when the tragic events unfolded. On the day of the incident, Duane was traveling along the Turner Turnpike, a major highway in Oklahoma that connects several key cities. The highway is frequented by truck drivers due to its strategic location and accessibility to various routes. As Duane approached a mile 31 on the westbound lane of the Turner Turnpike, he decided to make a scheduled stop at a rest area. It was around 8pm when he pulled his truck into the rest 
rest stop. His intention was to use the payphone to call his wife, a routine check-in that he regularly performed to stay connected with his family during long hauls. The rest area was a typical highway stop, equipped with basic amenities for travelers, including restrooms and payphones. After parking his truck, Dwayne stepped out and walked towards the payphone. He had announced his plan to stop and make a call over the CB radio, which might have been overheard by others in the vicinity. As he approached the phone booth, he began to gather loose change from his pocket, presumably to use for the call. It was at this moment while he was focused on making the call that he was suddenly and violently attacked. Dwayne was shot once in the back with a shotgun. His heart was pierced, causing him to die instantly. The attack was swift and brutal, leaving him no chance to react or defend himself. His body was found lying on the ground near the phone booth, surrounded by scattered coins, indicating that he was in the process of making the call when he was shot. An anonymous caller reported the incident, prompting the Oklahoma Highway Patrol to arrive at the scene shortly after 8 p.m. Upon arrival, they found Dwayne's lifeless body and immediately began to secure the area for investigation. His wallet and keys were missing, and it was estimated that approximately 25 bucks had been stolen, suggesting that robbery might have been a motive. The investigation into Dwayne's murder faced immediate challenges due to the lack of witnesses and the isolated nature of the crime scene. However, reports soon emerged about a brown Ford Pinto that had been seen harassing truck drivers in the area. The vehicle was distinctive equipped with a CB radio antenna and was occupied by a white male, a black male, and a white female. This same vehicle had been involved in suspicious activities, including an encounter with another truck driver, Ed Heitkamp, just a day before Dwayne's murder. The encounter reported by Ed Heitkamp involved a woman with blonde hair who approached him asking for illegal substances and behaving erratically. She was accompanied by individuals in a brown Ford Pinto. This incident occurred approximately 13 miles from where Dwayne was murdered, raising suspicions about the occupants of the Pinto and their potential involvement in his death. Despite these leads, the investigation struggled to make progress. The suspects in the brown Pinto were never identified, and no sketches or concrete evidence linked them directly to Dwayne's murder. 